welcome everybody. My name is Sean Douglas and I'm the president of the Board of Education. So I want to uh, thank everyone for coming tonight. We're here for a very important topic. We're here to talk about the safety of our children in our schools. Um, just briefly, um, our agenda tonight is going to be that um, our superintendent, Angela Smith, is going to talk about the efforts the school district has made to make our buildings safer. She's also going to talk about our communication plan and uh, how we communicate and coordinate not only with local law enforcement, but also with um, the, our parents. So she's going to talk about those things. Um, Officer Ralph Caswell is going to talk about our safety plan from a law enforcement perspective, and he's going to address those kinds of questions and issues tonight. Um, I will. I want to clarify that Ralph Caswell is a school resource officer. So you're going to hear the term SRO or the abbreviation for SRO. Um, he is a police officer. So in some school districts, they have security guards. In other school districts, they have armed security guards. In our school district, our elementary, middle, and high school, all of our buildings have law enforcement officers in the building. So we have the best we can possibly have here. Um, on, on behalf of the board, I want to say that there are five school board members. Um, all five of our school board members either have children in the school district right now, or they have children who have graduated from the school district. Um, I have two children in the school district right now, one in the middle school and one in the high school. So I share the concerns that all of you probably have about making sure that our kids are as safe as they possibly can be. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce Angela Smith, who's going to um, go ahead and talk about the efforts the school district's made. Thank you, Sean. Times have changed. Safety was something that you did in school, practice those fire drills back in the day when I was in elementary school. And you could walk to and from school and not worry about being stopped by somebody in a car. You know, you were told not to talk to strangers, but in essence, neighborhoods were a safe place to be and walking to and from school was a safe place to be. When you got to school, school was a safe place to be. Buildings were open, parents could come in and out, volunteer as needed. Volunteers didn't have to be background checked. Volunteers didn't have to have fingerprints to work alone with students. School was a different time. Well, times have changed. We're living in the 21st century. 1999, Columbine happened and it was one of the first major mass school shootings. 9-11 happened and nobody felt safe flying out of plane for a very long time. Terror was a word that became ingrained in our minds and our vocabulary. And then just two weeks ago, another mass shooting at Parkland, in Parkland, Florida, at Stoneman Douglas. So we have to talk about safety. We have to talk about what we do for kids to keep, safe, keep them safe. I have 3,200 students in this district every day. And safety is my number one priority. When I'm in meetings with various staff, I tell them I want our kids safe. That's what matters. I need cameras working. I need SROs where they're supposed to be. And if I make it through a week, a day, at the end of the day, I go, we made it through another day. Make it through a week, we made it through another week. I get to summer and I breathe a little bit easier because we made it through a year and our kids were safe. It's a tough job because I worry about safety on one hand, but then we also have to provide education on the other. So it is a lot of moving targets all the time in the school business anymore. But safety is our number one concern. That's why we're holding these meetings. Awareness is important. So we are always evaluating what we're doing. We're looking at what our safety plans are doing. We're evaluating our services. We're evaluating what we do and how we do it. We look at all our drills. We have Officer Caswell, who has been an architect of the safety plan since 1999. He's going to talk a little bit about how those plans have changed over the years. 
one of the things the board did, uh, I think it was about six or seven years ago, we put SROs in every building. That's unique to Madison. Not every school district has a school resource officer in every building. Usually the high school, middle school, elementaries, they may have a security guard or just the buzz-in system into the front door. But in Madison, we feel it's important to have an SRO presence in every building. And the SRO presence in every building isn't just about security, but it's about building relationships. Because we know that in order to keep kids safe, they have to trust the adults that they're dealing with. They have to talk to the adults they're dealing with. So that see something, say something that you've heard so much about becomes a reality. Because that's how we find out information a lot of times. Kids will come forward and tell us things. We have the Safe Schools Hotline that the numbers went home in that safety letter and it's on the website and it's throughout the buildings. We want kids to feel comfortable reporting things that concern them. And they can do that anonymously through that Safe Schools Hotline. Um, we want them to come to the adults. Social media is a huge presence, especially at the high school and middle school levels. And kids have been really good about telling us when they are uncomfortable with things they see in social media. And that is a number one deterrent to having something happen as tragic as Parkland. We have multiple cameras in every building. So there are about 50 in this building, I think, 50 at the high school, 75 in the two new buildings. And they look at the buildings from all different angles. There's cameras on the outside so that we can see what's going on. We have cameras in our building so that we, across the way, so that we can monitor what activities might be happening, especially on the perimeter of the building. So we have cameras so that we can see what, what's going on and what's happening throughout each building. They're not monitored 24 seven, but if we need to pull a tape or we get a report of something, then that's when we use them. We have created the buzz in entrances in every building so that people have to go into the main office and just can't walk into the building and into the main office. And then they sign in and get their passes. And that is another layer of security that especially at the high school, we changed where the attendance office went. So, the attendance office is now in that main office, so people don't buzz in and then go out into the building. We try and keep it all located right in that main office area. And that safety, safe, secure entrance helps to make people feel safe. We do regular trainings with our staff, the public school works, staff meetings, and in services where, where applicable. And those trainings are important because it gets them to talk about safety, review safety plans, and practice those drills. So right before they do a lockdown drill in the building, and Officer Cass will talk a little bit more about what a lockdown drill is, the procedures are reviewed with staff. I know in this building they use a index card so that there's different levels to the drills and they say what alert they might be on. We have continual communications with our local safety forces, and that is so important. We have regular safety committee meetings where the fire chiefs, police chiefs, all the SROs, all the building administrators, central office administrators, and even the IT people when necessary will come to the meetings and talk about safety issues. Those are important to have those conversations. We talk about building safety, we talk about community safety, we talk about trends within the community. Because as you all know, we also have a huge heroin epidemic in Lake County. And so we talk about those things and ways to help support our students, families, and staff. What's the best way to keep kids safe? Prevention. Prevention is key. Giving kids the tools and staff the tools to feel safe and know what to do in certain situations. We have regular drills, required by law to do fire drills, lockdown drills, and even evacuation drills. And again, Officer Kaz will talk a little bit more about what those drills look like. But at the end of the day, in order to keep our students safe, it is a community-wide effort. 
You've heard a lot probably in the last two weeks about mental health. Mental health is a key component anymore in, in schools. If you watch the news yesterday, um, depression is now something they want to screen for every adolescent in a wellness check because more and more of our students are coming in with symptoms of depression and it's going untreated. We have four-year-olds that come into the district with anxiety. So we know we have to work on the mental health services. One of the ways we do that is through Crossroads. We have Crossroads counselors available in every building throughout this district. We have student leadership programs to help build a positive climate because we know if we build a positive climate where kids feel safe and involved and committed, they're going to do better in school, they're going to be connected, and they're, they're going to take ownership of their school. In this building and in South Elementary, we have the Allies. At the middle school, we have the Student Ambassador Program. And at the high school, they're going to start a leader student leadership program similar to the ambassador program at the middle school. Students and community members continually coming forward with concerns, asking questions, providing input, those are important. Another key piece to our plan is that we want to hold meetings with students. I had hoped to do those this week, but I had a health crisis over the weekend myself and was uh, at Lake West for a couple days, so my schedule has been significantly curtailed this week, but I knew how important these meetings were, and I wanted to be here for them. So as soon as I'm up and around in the next week or so, I am going to schedule meetings at the high school, middle school, and even in the elementary classrooms to talk about safety and what does that look like at every age-appropriate level. So that's an overview of safety in this district. I know one of the questions that came up last night, and I will talk about it now so that we don't have to put it on an index card later, is how that message went out last week. There were multiple things that go into a message like that. You look at the time of day, what the message was saying, and how much alarm you wanted to, you know, it would bring. Well, because it was a rumor, we opted to go with a social media and website post. In talking to parents, in looking at things, I think the next step that I would add, because I think it was pretty well received last week, was the Infinite Campus email. I will still hold the phone call out for a true emergency, because I don't need third, you know, over 6,000 phones ringing at 11 o'clock at night for a non-emergency. But if it were a real emergency, I would want you to hear that call. I would want you to listen to the directions in it, and I'd want you to, you know, take action based on what we tell you to do. So in, in hindsight, I think an infinite campus email would be the appropriate thing to add as another layer of communication. When Officer Caswell is done, what we're going to do is we have index cards, and we're going to ask you to write down your questions on an index card, and we're going to answer them that way. So this time, I'm going to turn it over to Officer Caswell. Thank you. Uh, one piece of that is if you move, change your email, change your phone number, we'll never get a hold of you if you, if you don't let us know what that change is. That seems to be the biggest frustration is when we go to make contact with you and your number has been changed and the school doesn't know about it. So if you move or add a new email, it would be nice if you can get that to us so we can get a hold of you especially in emergency. So, a couple things. Anytime there's any type of threat or anything concerning related with the police and the school, I, I typically come in and, and take care of that. And, the, you know, the two chiefs here and the superintendent, we collaborate with any decisions that are made based on what information that we find. So it, it's not just somebody blindly making a decision. We actually investigate it and find out what's going on. Now, because we're dealing with kids typically, we're not going to give a whole lot of information about, especially names and, and very specific for that. But we are going to look into each and every one. 
and they're all different, but you know we're not taking a chance on it. So we, we look into it and make a decision as a group. So we did the cameras. Most of the cameras have a uh, record time of at least 72 hours. The middle school and south are a little bit longer. How long are your years here? I think it's 72. 72, yeah, the high school is about 72 hours now. The, the safety plan, in 99 I started writing those just so we had some kind of guidelines. You know, and when I started at the high school, the front doors were open. I think these doors were still open too. I mean, they, they weren't locked. Now almost all of the doors are locked. You can't get into like the high school into the cafeteria. You have to make a left turn and come into to the office. So those are just steps that we've over time have taken, just blocking doors. And now that there's a key fob system, so most people with keys in the community can't get in anymore. So the big joke is more people have keys outside than the staff inside. So you have to fob to get into most of your doors now. Uh, safety rules. Lockdown is is a term that is the start of a problem. That that is a term that tells you that there's a problem. It's part of the Alice program, which is alert, lockdown, inform, counter, and evacuate. The end result of that is no matter what the situation is, the teacher, staff, or kids have the option to do whatever they need to do to survive. We're not telling them to lock yourself in a classroom and hope for the best. If something's happening on the other end of the building, there's no reason for you to stay here. Get out of here. And there's pre-programmed places for, especially the elementary, so the teachers are going to take in their kids with them for them to go. So part of the plan is the last thing that we need is there's going to be 90 police officers coming and probably at least 100 firemen coming to this building if there's a problem. The last thing we need is 600 parents coming here too. Because we need the road to get police cars through, ambulances, and you know, fire trucks and emergency equipment. You will be told where to get your kids. Each building's got four different locations that we can take them to for you to pick them up. You will be told where to get them. God forbid anything bad happens if your kid got hurt, broke a leg, or something like that. There will be a police officer and somebody from the school knocking on your door letting you know. You're not going to find out about that from the press. We're going to tell you. You'll, you'll know where to get your kid. The big thing is, on Infinite Campus, that you're the person to pick them up or whoever you send has to be on that list. Now, the elementary teachers are so far ahead of the high school in the middle, it's not even funny. they got packets in their door, and they're out and ready to go. So I, I'm not worried about the elementary school with that. <coughs> but just make sure you take, bring your ID with you. Now one of the things that is in plan and we're going to do with uh, pre-K, parents typically pick up their kids, so it's not terribly big inconvenience to do that at a different location. And we're going to see how well that works. And we're going to practice that hopefully on the way up. We as a district have to do at least one of three plans over the course of three years. The uh, tabletop rules, what we did this year, or I'm sorry, 17, is I sat with each building, the chief emergency management, fire department, and we went through uh, drills, uh, everything from active shooter to uh, fire in the building. It's not just active shooter, it could be a gas leak, or for some reason we have to leave the building. You know, anything like that. We talked about those drills and how our plan encompassed that. And we made the adjustments as we found we didn't have everything we needed in the plan. So the next piece we're going to do this calendar year is a functional drill. And I use the example, if we have a fire drill here, if we block off this end of the building so kids can't exit that way, so that, that would be a change where now teachers have to change how they leave the building typically. That, that would be a functional drill. Then the other one is a full drill where we evacuate the building, go a whole nine yards, and see, see how that works. We've kind of been talking a little bit about doing that at the high school with maybe 100 kids volunteering and seeing how that works. But those, those drills are kind of in, in discussion right now. So that, that's where we're, we're working there. Uh, 
our plan for this district, according to the people on the phone, this is the model plan for the state of Ohio. We kind of used their guidelines, adopted what happens here, and we wrote, wrote the plan accordingly. Now, the police side of this is we, we've adopted a lot of things in relation to what the school's doing. We work together. So one of the plans is, and I've been told not to say bulldozer, but snowplows will be pushing cars off the road if they're in the way. And if they're in the way, we've got to get them off the road. So if you park the car here, it, it might be pushed off into a ditch or into a tree. It's just going to be out of the way. We need to be able to get squads in and out in an emergency. The last part, which I think the, the best part about Madison, is the, the relationships that our staff have with, with kids. I mean, I have uh, my goddaughter in the middle school, I have, I have real good friends, I have my cousins, kids at the high school. So uh, we always have family that are throughout the district in both police departments. We want to make sure people are safe. Our staff has, has kids here. And the relationship that's built with teachers and kids, that, that's our biggest strength here. Kids will tell us what's going on, and we will look into it. And we, we hope that the parents will too. While we're getting your questions, uh, we would be remiss if we did not introduce our two chiefs that are here this evening. We have Chief Fred McIntosh from the village and Chief Matt Myers from the township. So they came out to support us this evening. Do either of you, would either of you like to say anything? Um, I, I will say that when police are brought in, because school people are not safety experts, they are not law enforcement experts, that when we have police involved in a situation, we take our lead from them. So we take direction from the police officers. We have done that over the years with any type of incident that involves the police. When you are done with your questions, you can just pass them to the mill. That seemed to be the best way it worked last, last night. You've got to stand closer and ask your question. We'll be passing it back and forth. Um, one thing is, as you're writing down your questions that I thought of is that school buildings were, especially the older buildings, were designed for that different time. So now we're trying to take safety procedures that are modern safety procedures and, and penciling them into some older buildings. Our high school will be 50 years old. Uh, this building's even older than that. So. It is a challenge to incorporate all the, the laws and regulations that we have in relationship to um, the, the buildings, the older buildings especially. But then even if you look at the new buildings, people talk about glass in the cafeteria. Well, the South Elementary, that whole cafeteria is one glass window. The high school cafeteria is right there as you walk into the building. We design schools for education, not to keep people out. Are you teaching elementary kids Alice training? It's, if yes, who is in charge and who is doing the trainings? Elementary kids get a little bit different version of Alice that's taught in the classroom. So it's, it's not necessarily by the uh, police specifically. The you know, younger kids are going to follow the direction of the teachers, you know, including to throwing stuff at somebody or come on, we're all, we're all going here, we're all jumping out this window. That depends on what the situation is. One of the things with Dallas that I don't like to say, this is what we're doing each time, is that I can't tell you what the circumstances are going to be. It could start right outside your classroom, and God forbid it could start inside your classroom. 
you know, I, I can't tell you, you know, what to do. But we kind of have to be ready for everything. And, you know, younger kids are going to do what the teachers tell them to do. So we try, with, without trying to scare, you know, little ones. Does that answer the question? Or? Communication is key. Overall, the district doesn't do enough. Sending security letters home with elementary kids is unacceptable. You must over-communicate. How do you plan to do that? Okay, so we did attach it to an Infinity Campus email. I think we put it on the web page and in, in a timely fashion because we didn't want to take the time to mail it home because we wanted to announce these meetings in a quick way. We did send them home in the Friday folders. So if we have another set of forums and published dates, we can mail those home. We can do, you know, all the variety of communication blasts because as a, as a parent that had kids in school a long time ago, I do know you don't always get things home the way you need to get them home. But we did put it out in multiple media. <coughs> How are office staff prepared to handle a threat that comes into the school? Mrs. Rogas, do you want to take that one? Um, our secretary, and I, I'm almost afraid to say this, but when she pushes that button, even for a, just for a, a, a threat, she has never made a mistake. She's the best. So um, uh, the office staff communicates immediately with me, and I have set it up so that I am the only one in that office. They can exit, and no one, if the perpetrator would come into the office, cannot get to your students. They can't get down any of the hallways. And if you come to visit us now, you come in, they have to buzz you in, then you get into the little room at the front to wait. The kindergarten uh, parents wait there, and they're not allowed to go out and get their child until they're buzzed out through the door. That, that button works fine now. It's inconvenient for the secretaries, and it's also inconvenient for the staff. Stay close. <laughs> <laughs> Um, are SROs always on site and armed? Yes, they're armed. They are on site the majority of the time. Um, you know, the only time that they're pulled is if there is a safety meeting, but those are planned well after school is in session during the day. Um, but yes, they're on site. That's the goal. You're one of those. <laughs> Are we going to arm our teachers? This was also asked last night. It's an interesting debate that's going on nationwide right now. And if I ask the teachers that are here tonight, did you get into education to carry a gun and keep it in your classroom? I bet the answer would be no. I know I didn't ever think about wanting, I don't, I've never even shot a gun, so I wouldn't want to carry a gun and use it in my classroom. That is not, what we got into this profession for. We have experts, we have police officers in town, and in talking to the police, I don't think they want teachers necessarily armed. And it is a hot button topic, and it's gonna take a lot more debate than one incident nationwide. But it, it comes up, and it's something that I'm sure will come up again. Who will we report inf information to after school hours? Well, there is that Safe Schools app line, and that goes to emails, it goes to a phone number, um, it goes to myself, Dave Bull, and the building principal. If you need to get a hold of somebody else, you email the principal of the building, you can email me. My phone is with me 24-7. Uh, I get emails all hours of the day and night, so it's not a problem and we would get this thing taken care of as soon as possible. Are the police in the schools armed? I answered that, yes. That is a huge deterrent to anyone coming in to do harm. So yes, all 
all our officers in each building are. How do you do lockdown drills without scaring this age group of kids? I'm going to go to the expert. You know, our, our students, I, I believe, are so well trained here that it, I've not seen any of them scared once they've gone through it. Sometimes the little tiny ones um, might. Uh, there's one group that I always make sure that they know, but we haven't had a problem with that one group. Right now, it's, it's a room that um, students can't take change very well, but we have not had any problems happening, no. Um, I think it's kids look to us. If we stay calm, then they stay calm. If we feel like we're safe, they stay safe. And the next day after that um, email was sent out, this building ran well. Are there plans for metal detectors in the entrances? And that kind of goes with the previous question on another card. They asked if funding were not an option, what would, what would you like to see for safety measures? Well, I'm one person and I think I would like to see multiple SROs in the buildings because that, that provides you know, greater security of having police in different locations, more people to do things for kids with the mental health, more kids to be that trusted adult, you know, or more chances for that kid to connect with the trusted adult. So I'd like to see more in resources than in things, because I think if we had more counselors, more people connecting with kids, that's gonna be a better option. But as we all know, funding is an option. And we are still in the business of K-12 education and providing good education for our students. So if we're putting in metal detectors, it's taking away from something else. Because at the end of the day, the pie is only so big and it only goes so far. So that is, that is the conundrum we're in, in these times that we live in. I like this question. Are there parents on the safety committee? No, but I think we need to have a few. We'll work with our PTAs and our PACs to see who might be interested in serving in that, that, those roles. And like I said, I really like the question if funding were not a concern, because everything is always tied to some funding. Are fire drills, lockdown drills planned? I think we need to have supervised drills to see exactly if the children know what to do. Um, Fire drills, especially last week, because it just happened to be very nice weather um, in the last couple of weeks. And in some buildings, they have to do nine drills, and they have to record those and uh, send them to the state fire marshal. This building's one of them. So the day after the shootings, it was a very nice day, and I said, I called and said, cancel the drills. We're not sending kids out in a fire drill, because I think that would raise too much panic because of the way that whole situation went down. So they rescheduled, and then they did planned drills. So they were announced drills. They told at the high school, Mr. Fisher got on the PA and said, "I'm going to do. I'm announcing that we're going to do a fire drill now. When the alarm sounds, please exit the building." So we are looking at ways to mix up some of those drills. I had heard from one district today that uh, the sheriff told them that it was all right for the kids to pause before exiting the building to make sure it was a real drill. So it's a conversation that's happening all over the place. Um, in terms of lockdown drills, are they planned ahead of time with students? They're planned ahead of time with the staff, but the students are so well trained that they listen to the teachers and only if there are some students that just need that little bit of special attention, then those aides and teachers in that building might alert. But I don't schedule drills ahead of time and put them on a calendar. And I believe that I see some parents in here who have been in our building during fire drills and lockdown, so they know they work. <laughs> Are there panic buttons? Each main office has a panic button that goes to the county, and then that 
takes care of notifying the police immediately of any crisis. And those are tested twice a year. Are the counselors from Crossroads present at the schools weekly, monthly? I know they're in here at least weekly. Sometimes twice. Could we use more of those resources? Absolutely. Are the doors in the classrooms locked and locked down? Corralling children's in hallways or behind desks are easy targets. Exiting the building is preferable. They can run. That would be a harder target. Um, teachers have been instructed as part of the ALICE training, and it's right there on the ALICE website, that you are to lock your classroom door. It is, it's a safety thing because it's one more layer of protection. We also, when we built the new buildings, bought every classroom in the district a barricade. So there is a device that will add one more layer of protection on every classroom door to prevent somebody from getting in that way. We have tested the drill, the devices with staff. We have them inspected by our maintenance staff because I like to say they are the world's best dust collectors. That's what I want them to be. I want them to be something that hangs on that wall and it just collects dust. That's my goal. If you are sending kids to four different locations, how does a message get sent out timely to the correct parents for a pickup? The reunification plan is each building got four locations that we can send people to. Doesn't mean they're going to four. We, depending on what's going on, have to make a decision on which building we're going to send them to or which location. So it's kind of situational is what's going to happen. If there's something here and they go across the street, that means it could be across the street. So that piece is, you're not going to have to go to four different buildings to pick up kids. There are just four locations that we have available throughout Madison. And the last one kind of addresses, I think, all the buildings. We have asked all the SROs in each building to have a car on site so that people know that there's a police officer in that building. And they are required, they are usually the first person in the buildings in the morning because I think our kitchen people are usually the first people in the buildings in the morning, aren't they, Cheryl? Just about. Um, because they've got to get breakfast ready and they're the, and the custodians, actually the custodians and then followed by the kitchen staff. So the SROs are shortly thereafter how are kids who make threats being held accountable? We have a student code of conduct. The police have their procedures that they have to follow. In the student code of conduct, I am telling you that if somebody is threatening certain things, and, and we've done them even with little pocket knives to come to school, and I've had to have little kids in my office um, for an expulsion here because they accidentally brought the pocket knife in because they were out fishing or doing something with the family at camp and it ended up and they took it out during school and the kids told the teacher and it gets to the administration and I've had those types of hearings. So we do have a zero tolerance policy. There is that 10 day with a recommendation for expulsion and we deal with each situation as a case by case basis. But we do follow it to the highest extent possible in the student code of conduct. We take it very, very serious. In terms of uh, police, I do know that they charge the students. Uh, when a kid makes a threat, they'll charge them with inducing panic often. And the courts, in light of recent times, have been supporting those charges. If you continue to have questions, we're going to put these FAQs together. Probably it will be the following week and we'll have them up on the website. This meeting will be up on the website. Um, we appreciate your participation this evening. Thank you.